Good morning. Uh, we are here for uh, SharePoint development with web parts, ASP.NET web forms. Pretty excited. <laughs> I'm just kidding. It's early. We got to have some kind of humor, okay? Uh, my name is Seth Juarez, and we have over here Chris Lauren. And today we are going to demystify machine learning and deep learning for you because we feel that there is a lot of hype, and it's time to show you the ugly messiness that is machine learning. Show us the way it's happening. I mean, so I'm going to start with first this notion of data science, okay? You've all heard the term, and sometimes we use the words science wrong, right? We say we've got this down to a science, we think there's precision, but science, as we know, is glorified guess and check, right? You, you come up with an idea, you try it out, and then it works or it doesn't. There are many sad tears that have been shed of things not working. And so the stuff we're going to show you, we know works, but it may work a little bit differently for you. So there will be tears shed. And that's OK, because this is also with data science. Let's talk about machine learning. And I'm going to tell you a, a little story. How many people work for a bank? I'm sorry. <laughs> sorry. Uh, you're, your database should be on the dirty job show. You know what I'm saying, if you're the DBA for that? Uh, imagine you work for a small bank, and your boss comes to you and says, I went to build, and they told me that we need to infuse AI in all the things. And you're like, OK, this is not going to go well for me. And you work for a small credit union, and they say, hey, what we want you to do is we have images of checks that we scan at the teller. And you need to write just this one thing, an algorithm that detects whether the check is upside down or not. And you're like, OK. Because you're a cheap bank, your checks have a black stripe at the top. So your programmer lizard brain right now already wrote an algorithm, didn't it? You know, just look at like 40 pixels at the top in strategic places. And if they're all black, leave it alone. Otherwise, flip. So because you, Sally, dear engineer, are so amazing, you get this out, and you have a really good DevOps process in a half hour. And everyone applauds your brilliance and says, good job. Then the guy, let's say his name is Tim, comes down and is like, you did such a good job, Sally, at infusing AI that we have one, just one small request, just this one thing. Famous last words from marketing guy to dev, right? It's like you, everyone, just, it's just this button that launches something into space and puts people on Mars. That's, it's just one button. <laughs> You've all heard this. So uh, Tim says, Sally, this is just one thing just for the guy that owns the bank. He really likes his cats. And he, just for his checks, we want you to be able to put a picture of his cat on his check. Just him, just for him. And you're, Sally, you're, you're Sally, you're like, OK, well, ugh. lizard brain, programmer. The first thing you ask is, well, can you give me a picture of this cat? And he gives it to you, and you're like, OK, well, you know, if Stripe at the top, I don't know what language this is. If Stripe at the top, leave alone, else flip. And then you have to have another if statement, right? And then you sample a couple of pixels, because that's what our programmer lizard brain says. And then if the cat is upside down, you flip it. Otherwise, you leave it alone. And this one takes 45 minutes but then it's out. Tim comes down day number three and is so excited and says to you, Sally, you did such a great job with just, just this one thing. Now we want any customer to put any picture on any check they write. That's when our programmer lizard brain explodes. <laughs> right? Do you notice that there's like this interesting gap between the picture of the cat and any picture that all of a sudden breaks our lizard brain, right? Do you feel that? Like there's, the, in, in, in all of our programmer heads, we're thinking there's this interesting difference between that and the other. In that difference, in that gap, that's where machine learning works the best, okay? So that singular intuition is very helpful. If you're going home and you're feeling bad because you added another if statement to your program and it works, or you change a 0.5 to a 0.7, and you feel like you need to take a shower after you wrote that code, <laughs> if you're doing that, right, you might be in the area of machine learning. You see what I'm saying? 
And I, I, you already read this. All of you probably read what was on the slide. I just wanted to give you a story of it. Machine learning works best when instead of creating a series of steps, you give it examples of the right thing and it figures it out. That's machine learning, okay? And it starts with a very sharp question because machine learning can only answer very specific questions, okay? And these are them. How much, how many? Which class does it belong to? Are there different groups? Is it weird or which option should I choose? You've probably heard them called like the fancy name. Okay, and by the way, these slides that you can have them, I will make sure you can have these slides. I want you to, I want you, because we are gonna do some maths. In America, we only have one. Everywhere else, it's maths, plural, okay? And sometimes you even hear them separated like this. Starts with a sharp question. Like if you think of a self-driving car, you can, you can diminish every decision it makes into a yes, no question. Should I turn left? Should I turn right? Should I hit this person, right? <clears throat> And it's important, right? And so you can see that you can make in these questions create it. And it's when you put them all together that it makes really, really smart sense. Okay. So then, now that we know what this is, and they've told you to infuse AI in all the things, how do you go from a cool idea that you have with AI into profit? Well, it turns out that there's three options, and we'll start with the easy option. How many of you have ever used a PDF file? Okay. How many of you weirdos have ever looked at a PDF file in Notepad? Weirdos. <laughs> Me too. It doesn't make any sense, right? But we are comfortable using PDFs. We are comfortable viewing them. And if your boss says you need to go ahead and turn this Word doc into a PDF doc, you buy something and it does it, right? And you're okay not knowing what's inside of it. But some of us weirdos are still going to look at the PDF and the notepad file. In this case, the easy option for us with AI is you can just use something, right? And we have something called Cognitive Services, which allows you to infuse your apps, marketing wants me to say this, websites and bots with intelligent algorithms to see, hear, speak, and yeah, you get it. Just use it. And it turns out that it's very easy to use. Am I right, Chris? Absolutely. All right. We have here, these are the updates for Build that we have. We have tons of Cognitive Services that do a ton of amazing things. But I can sit here and talk about it, but I'd rather you... Show us how it's done, my friend. Yeah, let's do the easy way. Easy way. Because it's still pretty early in the morning. That's right. The easy way, look at the pretty website. And then I'll show you some code since we're all developers here. So this cognitive service can take any face. And we can upload pictures without writing any code to get started because we're going to warm up in the morning here. So I can click browse. I can upload a picture of my daughter. And it's going to... Take a look, and it's going to identify some, some interesting characteristics. Like I said, it's morning. Let me click the, the right one. Click the right button, Chris, OK? We've got a high bar to set here, dude. All right. So it's going to identify what we call a bounding box. It's going to say, oh, yep, there is indeed a face in there. And it's going to take some best guesses as to some things like her age, gender, identify that she's got glasses on, sees that she's happy. Gonna take a guess at her hair color. It's a little bit difficult because she just got it colored for her birthday. So it's a little couple different colors. That's a little bit harder. But you can see we get back a JSON response here that we can use in any kind of program, any kind of application. Now, cognitive services can do a lot more than just identify faces, though. We can also identify some interesting things about different scenes. So I went on a trip to Thailand recently, for example. I'm gonna upload this picture of me with an elephant. And I don't know about you, but I never thought I would write code that could generate something like a person is petting an elephant. I've uh, had to. It's pr pretty amazing that I can just take, take a look at the scene, identify what's going on, and not only give some descriptions, but actually generate some kind of human readable sentences or description about what's going on. And again, the response comes back in uh, JSON, programmatic, usable, it's great. Now we'll use the text analytics API. Again, it's not just all about images here. So we can go ahead and paste in, paste in some text, and we can analyze this. And we'll get back some sentiment analysis. It'll identify some keywords in there. And we can see that the Microsoft Build Conference, the Washington State Convention Center, Seattle, and oh, Chris and Seth need some caffeine. 
Chris likes coffee, Seth likes soda, it understands coffee, doesn't highlight soda, but that's okay. You get the, the idea, is that it extracts key phrases, sentiment, and again, all the responses come back in this way that we can work with in any application. So let's go ahead and take a look at what that looks like inside of an application. Now, I mentioned, you know, as developers, probably start with something like Visual Studio or Visual Studio Code. So I'm going to show you that using those cognitive services, it's never been easier to get started. You can create a new project. We've got some templates using an extension in Visual Studio called Visual Studio Tools for AI, whereby you can create a new template uh, project which will automatically connect to the cognitive services and generate some code. Now, I'm going to show you, we also have a list of the cognitive services that I, as a developer, already have access to. So I can easily discover them, and I can learn more about them. I could right-click, I could create a new one if I wanted to, uh, and I can even open the Getting Started page so I can learn about what these things are. So if somebody else has provisioned one of these cognitive services for me, I can just see that it's there and go, oh, what's this? Let me get started. But I'm going to go ahead and generate uh, an application here. I'll right click and I'll create an application and I'll give this a, a name. Uh, I'm not feeling super creative this morning. All right. So it'll even do some basic error checking for me, which is great. And I'm not authorized for this one. Let me go ahead and refresh. Just make sure that my connectivity to the cloud is good. And we'll try this guy again. Don't worry, this literal thing happened to me during Harry Shum's demo, which is really embarrassing because he like runs stuff. All right, so you can see that not only did it create all, all the references to the cognitive services SDKs that I need, it generated some sample code and even included my subscription keys in here so I don't have to go muck around and figure out where those keys are. So I can try it, get started, and get familiar with how these things work. So we can go ahead and, and run this code. And I'll go ahead and grab a path to an image that I want to pass. And then this will o open up the image again. And you can see that I've returned the, the exact same JSON that I got from the website. So now I have some working code that I can include in any application quickly and easily without having to learn the principles behind it yet. But then now once I have some sample code, it's super easy to modify it exactly how I want it to work. So that's a quick example of how we can use cognitive services in the cloud, generating applications. We can do the exact same thing with the, the text API and, and others as well. So hopefully that shows you how easy it is to infuse AI into your applications. Awesome. And this is immediately actionable. If any of you accept images on any of your web properties or any of your software, you can check for objectionable content right away. You can automatically tag it. You can automatically create captions because you know people don't want to type stuff when they put stuff up on your website. Maybe you could suggest something. You can do this right now. And notice that it was just a couple of clicks after we sign on to Azure. That's an important bit. I yeah, think. Uh, absolutely. Yeah. Cool. All right. So easy, like a PDF. But sometimes, you know, option two, those maybe we have very specific pictures or logos that you need to recognize, right? Maybe you need to blur out product logos when people upload stuff. Or maybe there's a specific object that you have at your plant that needs to be recognized that doesn't fit into the pre-built AI stuff. Maybe you need to learn a little bit more about PDF intricacies, right, to go with the example. Option two, still easy, but a little more work, is you customize the pre-built AI that we have for you. Just, cause, just a tiny bit, a tiny bit, right? And the way you do that is you use cognitive services again, but we have customization for each one of those sections. We have custom vision, custom speech, language understanding and intelligence service, Lewis, custom decision and being custom search. So now what you're doing is you have, you can either use the stuff that's pre-built and it just works, do it, or you need to do just a tiny bit of customization. We also have that for you, and Chris is going to show us how to do that. Absolutely. 
So here I'm showing you the custom vision AI website. So just like before, we've got some intelligence in the cloud in these pre-built models that are able to interpret the images and provide some intelligence and do some things like classification. Now, as I mentioned, nobody got the hint. No sodas, no coffee showed up. So thank you all. Uh, so Seth and I decided that you know we've been working pretty hard on this talk, and we don't really have time to go and get ourselves a drink. So we wanted to build a robot to go and get our drinks for us. Because we're lazy. We are. Yeah, it's true. Now, I don't have the robotic skills to figure out whether to bring me a soda or Seth uh, uh, brings uh, Seth a soda. But uh, I do have the ability to train a model, customize a model that makes sure that the robot gets me the right drink. And so this is kind of a classification problem. Make sure, go to the kitchen and grab the right thing. So uh, here I've uploaded a bunch of images. You can see on the, the lower left-hand side, you can see these tags. Tags, you can call them labels, you can call them classes, you can call them whatever you want. But essentially, these are just like categories. I've got a bunch of different images of Pepsi, soda, et cetera. And I want to make sure that the robot goes and grabs the right thing. So when it looks at it, it's going to be able to classify it by looking at the thing. That's the whole point here, custom vision. So I'm going to show you how to customize this, this model by uploading some images. I'm going to grab some files from my local machine. And I've got a bunch of images of Coke, so it will make sure that Seth gets his Coke. Yeah. And I'll, I'll make sure up. and say, yep, these belong to the Coca-Cola class. OK, great. So I'll go ahead and upload those images. Now we're done. And then now I'll simply click Train. Now, what's happening behind the scenes is it's using that, the pre-built model that existed that understands kind of the high-level characteristics of objects. So this pre-trained model, and then adding the customization of my images that I care about in my classes or my labels that I want to be able to predict. You see how fast the training was using the power of Azure and being accelerated by the fact that there's already this pre-trained model up there, so it already understands the basic characteristics of how to understand the world ar around it. So now that I have some high-level quality metrics as well, you can think of these as kind of almost like your pass rate, your unit tests, uh, some key metrics by which you would never ship code to production unless you're better than. Uh, and so then include this in your application. It's as simply as easy as clicking the prediction URL. This generates a REST API that you can use. And then you can pass that URL, pass that image to the URL and get the response identifying what class it is. Now, to make it even easier to include in an application that you might need to deploy offline uh, on a mobile device that has no network connectivity, for example, you could generate a core ML, you could export your TensorFlow model, or you could download your Onyx model also. And you might have heard a little bit about Onyx this week. It's an kind of an interoperable standard, so you, you can train models using any kind of toolkit like TensorFlow, Keras, CNTK, et cetera. And then Onyx is an intermediate representation that enables training a model in one way and then running it on a whole bunch of different hardware in, in another way. And we'll talk a little, little bit more about that later. But we'll go ahead and export this. And I'll get this model file that I have on my local machine and that I can use in my application. Now, this is pretty awesome because no one else lets you use the, the cloud to train and download the model this easily so you can run anywhere on any device. And this is amazing because we're not trying to lock you in. We are so confident in all of our other cloud services that we think it'll just be like a warm, fuzzy sock on a Sunday afternoon that you're not going to want to take off. But if you do, we'll let you take what you trained. We'll let you use it wherever you like. Nobody else does this. That's how confident we are in what we do. Absolutely. But again, I don't want to have to go use the website, upload the images, download the stuff, click, click, click every single time. Usually want to keep track of some key metrics and identify whether we're getting the quality bar that we're looking for, and then programmatically retrain that model by, say, adding some new images that take into account, say, you know, different lighting conditions. Maybe we repaint the kitchen, put in some you know, green lighting. And so it affects the way that the robot would understand things in the kitchen. So we might want to upload some new images on a periodic basis. And again, we can simply create a new application. This will generate some code that programmatically retrains that we could kick off on a regular basis. So what you're saying is, uh, just to be clear, is that what we saw on the website, you can do all of that in the code as well. Absolutely. Cool. Yeah. 
And you can choose whether to use uh, C sharp code or Python code to programmatically retrain this. So I'm going to go ahead and choose some C sharp code. And we'll just add this to the current solution to make things nice and easy. And again, notice that we've got the, the SDK references all ready to go, and we've got the working code with the API keys all, all in place. So I'm going to go ahead and, and run this again. And we want to, oh, let me set my startup project. And we'll give this a name. And then we'll provide uh, the path to the input directory. Now, again, this is this, the same directory that I uploaded from before. You can see I've got a bunch of images of Coke. I've got a bunch of images of espresso, et, et cetera. And so we've separated these into some training images and then also some testing images. And this is super important. I mean, this is just like test cases. But instead of writing code to test it, then you provide some examples and say, I know exactly what that one is, and I'm going to label that and make sure that when the prediction runs, that it correctly identifies it. And then finally, the generated code will also download the model for you automatically as well. All right. Looks like I'm having some connectivity issues, unfortunately. And that's okay, because I, I think you're getting the sense for what's going on, right? We did not come in with some prefab code, and then we, we used regions maliciously to make you think it was really easy. He right-clicked and made it from scratch, right? This was, there was, no, there was no, nothing up our sleeves. In fact, I'm not even wearing long sleeves for that <laughs> purpose, right? You can see that it's very easy to do that. So here's the thing, like, and, and this is important, right? Notice that we're, we're, we have uh, uh, services that you can use. Just right off the bat, you can call them. We have ways that you can generate code to call the pre-built services. We have services that you can customize in Cognitive Services, and we have code that you can right-click and do to use to customize. And we allow, it's amazing that you can just use it all right now. There, you, like if you were to leave, and we've only spent like, I've spent like 10 minutes blather skiting, the real thing you could, could have done in five minutes, right? You could in five minutes get started with this stuff right away. But now here comes the, the hard stuff, right? Because we wanted to demystify deep learning because I want you to get a sense for how messy it really is. I'm gonna explain what the PDF bits mean on the inside so you get a sense for that. And if you take nothing away from this because it is early and I might have to talk about calculus. You okay with that? I don't know. Sir. It's a little early. I still haven't gotten any coffee. Okay, so uh, what I want you to take away from this, even if you don't understand anything else, is I want you to know what it is that it's saving and what it looks like and how you use it in your application, if, it, if nothing else. Because now we're gonna actually get into option three. Right, remember option one, use pre-built. Option two, use customized pre-built. Option three is actually make your own stuff. Okay, and if you've never done this before, this is a primer on what it is that you're building, why it takes so long, and why it's a little messy, because when you're building custom AI, there's actually a series of steps. The first one is you have to have a sharp question, and it needs to fit one of those five things. And if in, in the case of what we're doing today with deep learning is we're gonna do, we're gonna do classification, which is answering the question is which class does this thing belong to? That's the only one we're gonna focus on today. And there's a series of steps. Once you have your question, you gotta see if you actually have data. Do you have data that will answer that question? Sometimes you do, sometimes you don't. Sometimes your data is ugly because Bill in the back always puts the name in the age field and for some reason he, he won't stop. And so you have to fix that. Right? A lot of the work of data science is preparing the data so that it can go into the next phase, which is experimentation, right? where you try a lot of stuff, and it won't work the first time, and it'll be frustrating. But eventually, as you progress and you learn more about your data and you create these models, these things are able to do amazing things, and the, the output of the experiment is this thing called a model. Think of the model as an asset that you bring into your program that knows how to do smart stuff. You saw already, Chris, show you that you can download the models from custom vision service and put it into your project. Just think of a model as something that you call, that you put into your, uh, that you put into your project, that you put in things and it produces the prediction. Okay, that's all, you, that's all that they really are. And they're 
effectively bag of networks and numbers. It's not even, I wish it was more exciting. I feel bad. Like, all I need to do is like say blockchain at the end, and then you'll be deep learning and blockchain people. We make millions together. <laughs> Pretty excited. Once you have this model, once you have this model, you got to find a way to deploy it. How are you going to actually use it? Some people put it into services. We're going to show you a really cool way to do it uh, at the end. Or you can put it directly into your program, which we're also, I think, going to show you. Absolutely. Right? Uh, and so deployment is also important, which gets into this place of like operations and dev for AI. Let's call it ops dev. I don't know. Is there a better term for that? Dev ops, maybe? Uh, I, oh, there is that. We have, to do this, we have an AI platform that can help you. Right? And, I, and you, you've probably seen slides with a lot of stuff of, of frameworks and infrastructure and tools, but I, honestly, that stuff doesn't make any sense unless you know what it is that it's doing. Because there are two phases, right, to these things. And so this is a slide that doesn't mean anything to anybody, right? This is all the stuff we do, but it doesn't make any sense until we show you what AI is actually doing or what you're doing with machine learning. There's a lot of people that will swoop in and give you this hype about a robot name or some other thing. That's hype. We're going to show you how it actually works. All right. So let's talk about deep learning. All right. And we're going to start with uh, uh, this program that uh, you built. Let's, let's take a look at this program, the one that does the faces stuff. Absolutely. So uh, let's switch over to the machine here, and you're going you're gonna to run this uh, project here. Uh, OK, you ready? You ready for this? I am. So this, this program was built and trained using CNTK to create a couple of different models. Notice that we've got these bounding boxes around our faces, and as Seth makes silly faces, then it's going to identify some emotions as well. Now, notice in the upper right-hand corner, uh, these, we had some charts tracking our emotions over time as well. So we were thinking that we would just point this at you all and kind of use this instead of the session evaluations at the end, but figure that I needed my machine for other demos instead. So I wanted to actually get into a little bit about how we built this sort of thing to give you a better understanding rather than just make silly faces at it all morning. Oh, yeah. Although that right. might be more fun. That's, that's right. All right. So when you're looking at this, by the way, we're going to just look at the problem of like, because there was multiple problems. There was an AI problem of finding the faces, and there was an other AI problem of solving what kind of emotion I had. And I have a range of emotions, because I was in the theater when I was in high school. That doesn't count to being in the theater. I'm sorry. I'm just kidding. Right? Effectively, let's just solve the emotion problem. As a programmer, we want this. Right? This is what you want. How do you build this? And it turns out that in AI, what we're doing is we're trying to find a function that given, for example, a picture of a face will return an emotion. Or given a picture of a road tells you to turn left or turn right. You see what I'm saying? We want this magical H function. And this is actually what it's called inside of the machine learning literature. It's called the hypothesis function because we don't know if it'll work. You want a hypothesis function that will predict the thing that you want. Right? But the question is, there's two questions. As programmers, our lizard brain was like, well, what does the X look like, Seth? Well, it turns out that the X looks like these pictures. Right? We give it a lot of pictures of examples of emotions. And we say, this picture is surprise and happiness. This one's fear and anger. The computer sees something like this. That's really ugly, Seth. Yeah, I know. It's like the matrix. And we zoomed out on purpose. Because this is the kind of thing, when you open a PDF file, you're looking at it. Notice the column all the way at the left is like the enum answer of the emotion. Do you see that? Like zero, zero I don't even know what they're mapped to. All of the, the numbers after that are the literal pixel value from zero to 255. Right? And because they were black and white picture, a grayscale, we only have one slot for the number from 0 to 255. That's what the computer gets to learn. Does that make sense? That's what it gets. Now, again, our programmer lizard brains want, are like forcing us to come up with a series of steps. But you've got to trust the process. The next question is, well, what does this H look like then? Right? If I get a bunch of numbers and I pass it into this thing, it's got to be doing some kind of computation, right? 
So I'm going to take you on a small journey. It may be just a hair mathy. If it's too much, just raise your hand, and I'll stop and say nice words like unicorn or fuzzy bears, right, to, uh, to help us streamline it. But what I need to do is I need to simplify the problem a little bit so that we're not looking at the whole image. So we'll look at this image, these images. These are a little bit easier, nine by nine pixel images, and let's create a problem where we're trying to figure out, right, if there's more density at the top or more density at the bottom, okay? So your prediction algorithm is gonna say, is it darker at the top or the bottom? For those of you that are pedantic and know about colors, I've reversed the image so that 255 generally means white, but in this case, it means all the way black, okay? Just for the pedants out there that are gonna come after me and say, well, Seth, it's not the right color. I know, I know, it's in there, okay? So again, we are coming up with a machine learning algorithm that predicts whether it's darker at the top or darker at the bottom. Okay, we got that? And those are the numbers that we, that, that we got to do the prediction. Okay, we good so far? Good. So I am just going to make something up. And it's going to be just a tiny bit mathy, but we're okay with math because we're all going to be data scientists by the end of this and be able to ask for $10,000 more a year. This is what we're going to invent. Okay? We just make it up. We're going to take each pixel value, there's only nine, and we're going to multiply it by this magical nine numbers called W. And then we're going to see what happens. And then we're going to add them all together and see what happens. Okay? Super easy. And then this little B at the end is to shift things over. So say, for example, if it's just a little bit darker at the top than the bottom, the B helps us with that. So as you're watching this, I am going to use, there's going to be some mathiness coming up next. Again, fuzzy bears, unicorns. I wish there's a way to put a bunch of numbers in like one thing and call it something mathy. Maybe let's call it a vector. Vector sounds great. Okay, let's call it a vector. And it turns out that when you multiply every element of the vector x and y together and you add them together, this is a mathematical operation called the dot product. You remember this stuff? Super easy. Now the dot product has an interesting relationship. Let's just say if we fix w and we give it all the x's in the universe, there is a special relationship with specific x's and w's that's at the bottom. If you look at an x and a w, these are points in space. And if you draw lines from zero to these points in space, there's an angle between them. Every time the angle between them is 90 degrees, the answer is always going to be zero, irrespective of the numbers inside of w and x. Did you know that? So for every x that we feed to a fixed w, if it's zero, it forms a line. Yeah? And for every x that's on one side, it's going to be positive. And for every x that's on the other side of that line, it's going to be negative. So this little machine that we just invented, right, if we feed in the nine pixels and it comes out positive, we can say it's on this side, meaning pixels at the top. And if it comes out on the other side, meaning negative, then it's pixels at the bottom. I'm, I'm a genius. You are a genius. Actually, Frank yeah. Rosenblatt, Now, are people going to have to write code to do this? No, no, stop it. I'm oh. just explaining the thing. Oh, I'm the oh, theory okay. guy. It's early in the morning. I yeah, I know, I sure. know. Thank you, thank you. This was actually invented in 1954 by Frank Rosenblatt, okay? This is not something that's, like, cutting edge. So here's the thing. Now we're going to feed it some numbers, okay? Feed it some numbers. And I'm going to let your lizard programming brain run loose. For this one, clearly the pixels are all at the top, right? So what numbers would you provide for W? And I know it's early, so I will help you out, right? If I do that, then the number at the bottom right-hand corner is positive, right? So we can guess pixels at the top. Booyah! But what if we get this image? We want the same W. What would you put there? Well, easy, we just put negative numbers at the end, right? while still retaining the positive numbers at the front. Do you see that? So now the answer is negative 234, and we guess bottom, right? But let's see. We've got to go back to the first one because we want to see if it still works, and it turns out that it does. Do you see what I did there? 
I, with my own brain and you together, came up with W's that will solve this problem, right? And so now we have a tiny machine where we have this W with ones at the front, negative ones at the, at the end, that if we feed any nine pixel image, we'll be able to predict top or bottom. You like that? I love that, but I think you missed one little thing hanging out there. Oh, what the B. That? What was that B? That's a good question. This B here. Let's just say, for example, that if the top was just a tiny bit uh, darker than the bottom, we want to guess top, right? Then what we could do, we can add a positive B such that it sort of biases it towards the top. Let's call it the bias. That sounds awesome. I love it. I love it. By the way, if you are a data scientist and you know this stuff, we are... We are being tricksy on purpose because that's actually called a bias, huh? Yeah, yeah, you like that? But what about, uh, so by the way, this is called the model. It's really dumb. It's a tiny model that you store and it's just a bunch of numbers, a W, that now you give it any nine pixel thing and it'll predict top or bottom, right? Because at the prediction time, you just say if it's less than one, predict bottom. If it's greater than one, predict, or greater than zero, sorry, predict Seth, top. This is a super like, boring example. Okay. Can you predict like top, middle, and bottom? I'm glad you asked, and this was not rehearsed. Uh, okay. <laughs> what if you want to predict top, middle, and bottom? That's a problem. It's not, just what, make one little machine for each of them, right? And there's gotta be a way to stack these numbers and call them something. Like, is there a favorite movie you have? Uh, I love The Matrix. Okay, let's call it a matrix. <laughs> let's call it, that's it. We're going to call W The Matrix. And it turns out that this matrix can actually be three-dimensional, and those things we call tensors. Whoa. I know. I know. And it turns out that if I give it this image, and I do the W transpose times X and multiply it through, and I, I'm dumb, right? I'm like, I think of the cookie monster when I see this. I don't know what's wrong with me. Take this X, grab it, turn it up to its side, and you, murm, 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 you know, it like multiplies and adds them all together. That's the sound of my head. Murm, 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 and then it produces these numbers. And the one that's the highest number is the one we predict, top, middle, or bottom. Do you see that? And then we can add this cool function at the end that actually flattens it into kind of a probability. Huh? That's pretty awesome. I know. So now we have another little machine, right, where we get W transpose X plus B, and B this time, there's a B for each machine, so it's a vector that we save. And so now this machine will look at all nine pixels and be able to predict top, middle, or bottom. Do you see that? Pretty cool. But Seth, you may ask, we want to predict this one. It does not have nine pixels. It does, it has a lot of nine pixel segments. So let's go ahead and divide them up. Right? We'll put those all together, we'll make a little machine for each set of nine pixels, and then we'll stack them. Does that make sense? And the higher you stack them, the more it's called deep learning. Does that make sense? Everyone's like, Oh, yeah. Wait, we're just storing a bunch of W's and B's in a network structure, and that's AI? Pretty much. I'm so sorry. Like, like you guys thought you were coming to hear, like, some novel-breaking work from... It's literally just a bunch of numbers you store in a graph structure. In fact, he's going to show you a model, hopefully later, and open it up, and you're going to see a graph structure with numbers in it. It's pretty sad. Absolutely. And so for those that are pedantic, this is kind of what's called a convolutional neural network because we're looking at pixels in a region and we're putting them together into a network. It's not fully connected like this, but I ran out of time and that's the drawing I had. So, I mean, that's it. That's it. So uh, what's the next question? I, I, I'm still super confused as to how you actually chose those Ws and Bs. Again, not rehearsed. Uh-huh. How do we get all these W's and B's? We don't want to, like, imagine, like, this deep network. Imagine this huge image. How are you going to come up with all these W's and B's? Well, what we want to do is we want to find a way to minimize mistakes. Right? We want to find a way to make the least amount of mistakes possible. So how do we do that? Use some maths for those that are British and math for us in America that only have one. Okay? So I'm going to put something up there. Again, fuzzy teddy bear unicorn. Remember, H is the function that predicts. 
Why is the right answer? Remember that column that said whether things were the top, middle, bottom? So if we guess one, and the answer is one, what does this subtraction equal? Zero. If we guess one, and the answer is zero, we get something that's not zero. So we want this thing to be as zero as possible. Kind of like what I was told when I was growing up. You need to be as zero as, no, that's not, that's, not, that's Sorry, now I'm getting into personal things. We tried to minimize his mistakes. But. <laughs> it turns out that for us, the H, is, in the H function, there's these hidden W's and B's, right? Because we have a bunch of them. We have the W's and B's for every little machine, for every nine pixel segment, and the W's and B's that live in the network. There's a ton of them, ton of them, right? I'm, there, there's gotta be a really fast way to multiply these matrices things, like, Matrix multiplication? Yeah, matrix multiplication. But using fancy hardware to make it easy? Uh, there's got to be something we can use. Like GPUs? Yes. Oh, okay. Right? Because matrix multiplication is what GPUs do when they're rendering that game you do all the time. That's why GPUs are so important nowadays when it comes to deep learning. This here function, by the way, is called the loss function or the cost function. We want this to cost zero. So the way that you minimize functions is you use calculus, right? And I'm gonna, I'm gonna, we're gonna try to motivate this here real quick. If you don't know any calculus, it's okay. I'm gonna show you something. Everyone's seen this function, right? X squared, parabola. Like pretend you're, pretend you're like a man or a lady sitting, a one-dimensional person sitting on this line. What's the lowest point of that function? I'll give you a hint. Rhymes with zero. Or zero, right? But if you're standing on this function, how do you know, like, let's just say you close your eyes and you're standing and you're like, okay, I wanna get to the lowest point. Where do you walk? Well, if you take a step and it's down, you wanna go that way, right? But how does a function, how does the computer know, the, the little, little man in the computer know which way is down? Well, we have to measure the slope, right? So let's do this. Let's take a little piece of y and a little piece of x and divide it, right? And that will tell us which direction we should go. We'll just call it dy by dx. Sounds good. I'm just spitballing here. So I'll just tell you what the derivative of this function is. It's 2x. So we're going to do just a little thought exercise so you can get a sense for what's going on. Let's just say that the little man is standing at 3, right? What's x squared? What's x squared at three? Nine. The derivative at three is two times three, which is six. Which direction do we need to walk? Do we need to walk six in the positive or six in the negative? Still early. Six in the negative. We gotta watch six, six in the negative. So if we multiply the derivative times a minus one, then we go in the right direction. So two times three is six, minus one is minus six, so we're gonna walk from three to minus six. So if we take three and we subtract six, how much, what, what are we at? Minus three, yes, I heard someone, thank you for bailing me out, oh goodness. Minus three, right? Okay, let's do this again. We're at minus three, minus three squared is nine. Two times minus three is six, minus six, times a minus one is six, so we're gonna walk six again. Where are we at now? Oh man. What happens if I keep doing that? You're never gonna get to the bottom. So we have to scale the step we take with the derivative. That thing is called the learning rate, and this algorithm is called gradient descent. So this ginormous function that we've developed with all the W's and B's, right? You start, you just guess a W, and at every step you give it more and more examples of the right thing, and what it does is it feeds forward, gets a value, and then with the derivative, we take a step back to update the weights. For those of you that are pedantic, W is a vector, so this is a gradient. Right? Okay, so even if you don't understand everything that's going on, you do understand this, that X is incoming, Y is the answer. The model function involves a bunch of W's and B's, and what you have to do is you have to feed it a lot of examples with the right answer, and it will reiterate. 
over and over and over and over and over again until it finds the right B with a loss cost function. We lost our cost function. In this case, it was mean squared error. There are others, though, that, that, that uh, Chris will use. And then the optimization using gradient descent. Okay? If you don't take anything else away from this, you've just learned that AI is a bunch of numbers in a network. And that's all it is. There's nothing else than that. Right, so you know what? I feel like I've blather skited enough, Chris. Do you have stuff to show us, buddy? We, we should wake folks up again. Okay. Absolutely. Okay, okay. All right, so er earlier we showed the application that actually understood how to interpret human emotion once we found little faces, right? But how did we do that? Just like when we use the custom vision web service, Anytime you want to train a model like this, you want to separate your data into a set of you know, the training set, the test set. You want to validate whether the thing is learning properly over time. Now, using the local Surface book with the GPU built into it, I can iterate step through my code locally using the Tools for AI extension in Visual Studio Code or in Visual Studio, and I can do pretty darn well. However, more data always beats better algorithms. So we made it possible to scale out that training job in the cloud using Azure Machine Learning we get, or Azure Batch AI to scale out your compute across a whole bunch of computers with these fancy GPUs so that you can handle really large volumes of data. So after you debug your code locally, then you can submit this to the cloud and use the power of Azure to train this really quickly. However, Probably a lot of you are wondering, why aren't we talking about Jupyter Notebooks? Because in, when we talk about data science-y stuff, a lot of data scientists really like Jupyter Notebooks as well. So I'm going to show you how we can use the exact same code that I stepped through and debug locally, but in a Jupyter Notebook using the new Azure Machine Learning SDK, which makes some of this a little bit easier. Now, I want to highlight the fact that in this notebook, we've got the ability to actually dynamically spin up a batch AI cluster. So that means that you don't have to pay for compute resources when you're not using them. You can simply run this. It'll automatically provision the cluster. It'll add machines as, as needed. You can specify what type of machine you want. The NC series machines have the you know, powerful GPUs in them, as well as the ND. The N series is pretty awesome for deep learning, as we talked about, because it does the matrix multiplication stuff really, really well. And then once that cluster is ready this, with this wait for provisioning, then we'll go ahead and basically run my code using the Docker container that I specify up in that cluster using the CNTK estimator. Using Azure Machine Learning, it's going to keep track of the status of my job over time, which is fantastic. And then what's super fancy, as we talked about earlier, what W's and B's do we need? Well, like some of these things, like the learning rate, we're going to have to kind of guess. Now, we can call it science, but fundamentally, we're just kind of guess and check. Now, doing this, what we call hyperparameter optimization, where we actually take some key metrics, like the, the learning rate and the momentum rate, how rapidly should we move around when we're trying to find the best values. The answer is, I don't know. Seth doesn't know. Well, he might tell you he knows, but he doesn't know. And so we just have to try and experiment and keep track of our experiments and keep track of the key metrics as we're experimenting to figure out which are the best values to use. And using the Azure Machine Learning SDK enables us to do this in a very automated way where the system will actually figure out which is the best value to use and more importantly and more interestingly, it'll update and progress with the, the next values, try it again, and run a whole bunch of these jobs in parallel and keep track of that key, key metric. Remember, we want to like, get, we want to screw up the least, make the least mistakes, have the lowest loss. We want to have the lowest classification error. Well, what we can see here is multiple jobs happening all at the same time. And see, some of the lines don't go as far to the right as others. What's happening there is we're actually killing jobs in the, in the cloud and making sure that we don't use compute for jobs which are progressing, but not progressing as well as others. And so we can make sure that only those which are showing promise are kept alive. So that's super promising capabilities here. It's pretty awesome. We dynamically spun up some clusters. 
We used a bunch of GPU machines in parallel to get the best value we could as fast as we could, and we killed the jobs that aren't returning the best results so that we can only use the compute that's really going to get us to the end result that we want to. And then once we have those mo the best models, then we can use them in Visual Studio. Here you can see I've got, we can download the models, we can reference the models in, in our code, and use Visual Studio to even keep track of and collaborate with the, the projects that the data scientists are working on if we want to. So that we can have all the same Python training code and the application code all together in one Git repo and iterate on the models and the project code at, at the same time together, just like we would with other developers. We can work with data scientists in the same, which is pretty awesome. Now we're going to go ahead and toggle back over to the slides for a moment because this is a super important, oh, this is a super important topic here. Here we go. Looks like we got it. Excellent. Because the way that data scientists and developers work is often very, very different. They're using different tools, different technologies, different languages and, and frameworks. And so these data scientists are training models using TensorFlow, CNTK, PyTorch, et cetera. And whether they're running them locally or they're running them out in the cloud, the point is, is that they're doing things that traditionally developers don't do. And the way that they're experimenting on their code and the, the way that they're improving those models is very different than the way that we write tra traditional code for applications. But we need to work together because data scientists are going to continue to update those models. They're going to produce better quality results, and they're going to want to make sure that those models roll out into those applications and services in the cloud or on the edge. So we have to stay in sync with one another. Now, one of the ways that we've helped make this a little bit easier is data scientists, you know, using all those different tools and frameworks to train their models makes it so that when you hand off the model to a developer, then the developer is going to say, oh, okay, well, now I can learn TensorFlow, for example, and now I can learn CNTK, and I can figure out how to use that model in my application and write some code, and that makes sense. I can do that. But then the next time a data scientist trains a model that's supposed to basically do the exact same thing, like learn the emotion, well, they might hand you a better model. And the next time they hand you a better model, it might be using a different framework, like PyTorch or something. And they go, well, OK, wait a minute. I just figured out how to you know, include the, this model in my application using this other framework. And now you're giving me a different framework. Now I've got to run that through my security review processes, work with my IT folks, make sure it's, you know, it's OK for me to operationalize this, in addition to learning that stuff. And so this is where Onyx is super helpful. I don't know if you, hopefully you've attended some of the talks, seen our booth on Onyx. If not, go check it out. But basically, this is a way to represent all the knowledge encapsulated in that model in an interoperable cross-platform way. Are you uh, saying that, that this is a way to just wrap the Ws and Bs in a nice way that everyone can share? Pretty much. And so you can train it with any kind of framework that you, that you like and either natively export it to Onyx or convert it to Onyx, and then use that Onyx model in your application. And that makes it super easy so that you can use the Onyx runtime, whether you're in the cloud or on the edge. And so no matter what tools or frameworks your scientists use to train the models, it's easy to include in your app. So like you would say that this is kind of like the PDF of deep learning? Pretty much. Close the loop. Close the, do you see that? See what I did there? All right. So now let me sh show you exactly how, how we do this uh, to train the model. We've got the sample images. We've got the links here. So I just want to walk you through this in a little bit more detail. We had a bunch of those sample images earlier. And we want to make sure that we use those sample images as well as we can. Uh, so usually, We'll make sure it have a sample data set, a small data set on our local machine. We'll step through the, the training model training code on the local machine and then scale out the training to, to Azure using a combination of Visual Studio tools for AI, VS Code, or Jupyter Notebooks hosted in the cloud. And then we'll keep track of that experimentation using Azure Machine Learning and we'll export the model and use that model in the application or we can host it in a cluster uh, in the cloud as well. 
In this case, I simply used that directly from Visual Studio, ran the app, and you saw that running locally. So hopefully that all makes sense. Now, we've been having a lot of fun this morning, and I hope you enjoy our banter, but I want to show you a little bit more interesting scenario where we actually do the exact same steps, but for a more interesting use case. There's a, a bunch of uh, folks down in Stanford did some research, and they found using one of the publicly available data sets from the National Institute of Health that had a bunch of chest x-ray images where they'd actually gone and labeled these chest x-rays, said, OK, this, this person has this disease, this person has this issue, so on and so forth. They went through the same process, just like we labeled the images, this is Coke, this is espresso, and so, so on and so forth. They just labeled the chest x-rays. So someone like me, who doesn't really know anything about radiology, can leverage the intelligence in the model later. So they trained the model and found that they were able to get the results, the prediction of what disease the, the person had at on par with kind of a, a human trained radiologist, which is really impressive. And they wrote a great white paper, it's super interesting, and they didn't share the code, they didn't share the model itself. But some of our scientists in Microsoft use our Microsoft AI platform and tools to kind of reproduce that experiment and, and train the model uh, as well. And so I'm gonna show, walk you through exactly how this works. But first, to, so you understand this picture, I want to toggle over and show you the application. It's beautiful. Thank you. Thank you, Seth. I really appreciate that. <laughs> so here I've got an iPad with the application that we built. And you can see, I can simply select a, an image that's on the local device. And we train the model, and we put the model inside this application. So we can select one of these images, and then we can select Done. And the image is being analyzed, or we're using the model to score the image uh, on the device. And so you can imagine a, a doctor in, say, middle of Kansas, or somewhere even more remote than that, where they're a great general practitioner. They may not be a radiologist expert, but they can look and with their patients and say, OK, let's take a look at what you, what's going on here. Let's triage quickly and identify whether it's worth driving to the big city to get better care. Right? So this isn't replacing the human in the loop. It's rather augmenting the capabilities of, of every human with the knowledge of all these other radiologists have gone through the process of labeling these images and then training the models. Now, you can see that uh, we've got some atelectasis going on here as well. And something like that might kind of make someone look and go, oh, you need to go follow up on that. But I've got a couple of other predictions here as well. And so that can, again, augment the human skill and look and say, oh, there's a couple of other things that I might want to follow up on in addition to, to the key thing. Now, the model running on the app here, certainly interesting. However, I want to show you that that exact same model can run other places as well. Using the powers of Windows ML, we can run the exact same model on, on the local device. We train the model once in the cloud, and then download that model and use it as an intelligent library, just like you would to generate a PDF. You can use that library anywhere. You can use that model anywhere as well. And that's super powerful. We can score any kind of different disease you know, on these x-rays very, very quickly. So you can imagine the doctor in the office just working through the notes. They, uh, they grab the image from maybe the centralized medical imaging records. And then they can take a look at it and get a feel for what's going on. But let me show you what it takes to actually build an application like that. So first. Again, I just want to make sure we have context here. This is the exact same process we showed you earlier for uh, identifying what kind of uh, drink it is or anything else. We start with the input sample data. In this case, it's the chest x-rays. We train the model using our tools, using our cloud. Then we export those models or host the models in the cloud. Now, I'm going to show you a couple of different ways to deploy the models, because this is super important. It, working inside Microsoft, we work with a lot of different uh, platforms. We sometimes need to deploy models to the IoT Edge. 
Sometimes we need to deploy models to, to Azure and run in the cloud. Sometimes we need to deploy them on iOS or on Windows or on Android. And so I'm going to show you how the data scientist can make one update to the model and make sure that the developers can include that model update programmatically following a DevOps CI CD type process that they, like they would for, for any other code and deploy this out to the IoT Edge. Windows, as well as uh, doing scoring in Cosmos DB using Azure Functions. So that's where we're going with this. So hopefully you've had coffee as well. So we're going to rub some DevOps on it then is what we're going to do. Absolutely. Yeah, let's do it. All right. By the way, as you're getting that ready, remember, those checks x-rays are literally just a bunch of numbers that are being multiplied through a network of other numbers that was saved into something called a package model. That's right. Okay, just remember, there's no magic here. Now, that package model, again, no matter what framework you're using to train that package model, it's still just a package model. And I'm going to show you that if your data scientists aren't training models using Onyx, it's super easy to convert them to Onyx. We're using tools for AI here in Visual Studio. We've built the uh, ability to use the model converters where we can convert from Core ML, TensorFlow, Scikit-Learn, et cetera, because models are just models. And so we convert those models to Onyx, and then I'll show you how to use these Onyx models uh, in, in an application, or even in TensorFlow models in an application. So again, we can do file new project. We've got some model inferencing project templates here, where notice we have this new Microsoft ML scoring library. What this does is this essentially wraps that model in some C-sharp code and provides the runtime to actually execute that model. So what I'm going to show you is how to import that model into an application and generate the code and put the runtime that will actually run, run the model. But I, as you can see, this is a demo. We've already got uh, a project here. I'm not going to create a new one. We can simply, in, for wi the Windows ML project, we can right click and we can add the, the model file. We can grab this chest XNet model and this will generate the C sharp code here. So you can see we've got the, the Onyx model added and we've also got the C sharp code generated. So it's really that, that simple. Simply right click, add, and we're good to go. Now, we can certainly see that this model is in this app, but I want to make sure that we've also got a reference to it in my inferencing project. Now, I'm going to, for this inferencing project, what I'm going to show you is that we can also package these models with the code that we're generating in a NuGet package. Now, a NuGet package, if you're not familiar, is just a way to kind of almost like zip up all your related code and DLLs and stuff together. It's an easy way to think about it. But this packaging code as NuGet package is something that most devs are pretty darn familiar with. And what this enables is versioning the model and its code in a consistent way, and then all your other apps can take a dependency on that NuGet package. So I'm going to go ahead and import the model here. And then I'm going to browse, and I'm going to grab the, the same model that I showed you before. But notice. We can also import TensorFlow models, the checkpoint files, as well as Onyx models. And so this process would work the, the exact same way. It's going to go through. It's going to analyze that network structure of the model. It's going to find the best inputs and outputs of that graph. And then it's going to generate some code here. But because we're generating code, I don't know about you, but like I follow specific naming conventions in my code. I'm not just going to generate the code based on what the data scientist constructed the graph to be. I want to be able to clean that up a little bit. So I'm going to go ahead and give this class a name. And I'll just call this chest x-ray model. And then we can edit the, the interfaces, the, the input and the output. So like instead of calling it evaluate, I'll call it predict. And instead of calling it input zero, which is not an interesting name. You don't like input zero? I don't. Okay. I don't. Okay. And then we'll say input the x-ray, and then we'll output the prediction. So that way, the code is going to be just a little bit more readable. Then we can click OK. And you can see now, again, the, the model is, is added to this, this application as well. 
and we'll make sure, let me show you, nope, I copied the wrong file here. Um, so the Microsoft ML scoring is generated as well as the inputs and outputs. This will run the model, this will list the tensors, return the results, all without writing any code myself, which is pretty awesome. Now, of course, I still get to write the code for the, the Azure function itself, but then we can just simply take a dependency on a NuGet package. And so we'll create that NuGet package by right-clicking, and again, export to NuGet package, and then we can host that on NuGet.org or we can host that on our own VSTS feed. Now, I showed you how to import the model for Windows machine learning and also to be able to run in, in Azure or other places that aren't upgraded to the latest Windows yet that don't have Windows machine learning. So you can use these Onyx models pretty much anywhere you need to. But we still need to close that loop on that DevOps process to make sure that we actually deploy this thing in an appropriate way. So notice I've got a, a build set up here in VSTS, and it's taking a dependency, it's looking, it's gonna trigger on this Onyx model. So whenever the data scientist checks in and gets, get pushes that Onyx model update, then it's gonna go ahead and trigger this build, which will generate my inferencing project, my NuGet package, so that will update that. It will, we also have another project build set up here that will look for the Onyx model. And using the, the Azure ML CLI, then we'll make sure that we update the, the Docker containers and roll this out to the IoT Edge. And we'll also update the Azure function when it's looking for either changes in my code uh, for the Azure function itself or when the build is complete for the NuGet package, which contains the model. So we've kind of daisy-chained a couple things together, and I know it's early, but just remember, the Onyx model gets committed, and then that triggers the build for the Docker container, at the NuGet package, and the Azure function. Now, as he's saying this, we're showing you a ton of things, just so you know that you have a model, you can do whatever you want. Right? We showed you crazy stuff on how, what you can do with the model so you can get a sense for how you can actually use it. But the thing that's important here is the model. And you can deploy it. You can have a data scientist update the model and have everything happen automatically. Uh, absolutely. And so what I'm doing right now is I'm simply uploading a bunch of images of that chest x-ray to the Cosmos DB. Because we don't always necessarily do scoring on device. We might want to, say, do scoring in the cloud and have an auditable record of what the prediction was at that point in time. And so we'll score those predictions as of that point in time along with the image in the Cosmos DB. So what's happening here is now this is spinning up a bunch of Azure function instances using a Cosmos DB trigger. And so as we're writing the images into the Cosmos DB, then it's also predicting those, those scores for the different diseases. So we can use the Cosmos DB Azure function view here. We can see it's a few seconds ago. And we can see that this is allocating compute resources, doing the scoring, updating the Cosmos DB in, in seconds. And we can go over to the Cosmos DB view of things. And we can run, it, run a query. And we can see that we have indeed uploaded a bunch of X-ray images, and we have the, the prediction of the different diseases uh, for each one of those X-ray images. This is pretty awesome because now it not only ensures that you can automatically keep that model up to date in, on all your devices and in the cloud, but also make sure that you can do the scoring in the cloud in a serverless manner so you can focus more on building and maintaining your applications as opposed to managing your infrastructure. It's pretty amazing. Let's give a hand. I mean, that was good stuff, right? Thank you. All right. So, a little bit of a recap, because we've done a lot of stuff for or this early of a morning, right? Uh, we have a ton of AI services in Azure, right? Notice that now that you understand that building an AI model, specifically a deep learning model, involves updating a bunch of numbers over and over again with examples. Now you understand why the cloud is so important. 
right? Because you need to train these things and it takes a long time. If you can have the infrastructure to do that, it's great. If you can have the services to do DevOps on it, it's wonderful. But if, you, if this is not your, your thing and you just wanna be able to import models, you can totally do that. Or if you don't wanna deal with models at all, we also have pre-built AI that you can customize yourself with a little couple of clicks and you saw that. Right? You can go do this right now with Visual Studio Tools for AI. Or if you wanna build custom models, let's just say this is your thing and you wanna get into building deep learning, uh, deep learning models using CNDK, TensorFlow, Keras, PyTorch, anything you want, we don't care what you use. In fact, we don't care if you take the model after you train it. We are so confident that the, the, the services and, and infrastructure and tools that we provide will be to your liking. And if they're not, you tell me because it's my job to fix it, okay? Uh, next, we also have Visual Studio tools for AI. Like if you're comfortable with uh, if you're comfortable with Visual Studio and that's your that's your thing, we have these tools built in. For example, right away, one of the things that you didn't get to show because we're running out of time is right away what you can do is if you open up Visual Studio and you're like I, I just want to try something in, in AI, you can actually go to the Azure Machine Learning Gallery. Is that what it's called? Yeah, the AI Tools menu, and then select Azure Sample Gallery. Sample Gallery. I always get that wrong. I don't know why that is. Sample Gallery, and it will create a project with an example AI thing, a machine learning project that you can run and see what it does, right? And if not, you can just spin up. You can spin up uh, uh, cognitive services to do the right thing. Okay, so let's recap. Here's some things if you want to find out more, but I want to recap very clearly. The key message today, AI is for everybody. You can use it today. You can, do, you can do it one of three ways. You can start with our pre-built AI and use that right now. You should go do that tonight, try it out. In fact, I think the first couple of thousand calls are free. Absolutely. You can use this for free right now. You can go and impress your boss, Sally, and be like, look, I infused AI. It took me 30 minutes, right? You can do that right now. Now, if you have things that need to be customized, you can use our customized pre-built AI. That's the second option. You can totally do that. We spent some time discussing what deep learning actually is and how it's built. Now that you know it's a network of Ws and Bs, you know how to train it, you know you need infrastructure, and you can burn that into your application using models. The questions now that you all have are gonna be like, well, Seth, how do I know what network shape I should use? Uh, the answer is very simple. Use science. Seth, I don't know what learning rate to apply to my model. I have a really great answer. Use science. Seth, gradient descent is not converging fast enough. What should I do? Use science. Use science. Maybe use the atom optimizer with momentum, for example. And the momentum rate is something that's a hyperparameter that you need to fix. Right? There's a ton of information here that you can find out more. Please make sure to do that, and if, if, if anything, Tweet at me or email me directly, seth.juarez at microsoft.com, so that if you have any questions, my job is to help you be successful in the cloud with AI. Thank you very much for your time. Have a great day.